Have you ever found yourself in an impossible situation or a seemingly impossible situation where it felt like the only option was to lose or lose, uh, to be defeated or be defeated, like to quit or to give up? Have you ever found yourself in a situation like that? I have. And unfortunately, I have to admit, I didn't always make the right decision. You know, when it comes to fight or flight, sometimes flight makes sense. Sometimes you just got to get out of there. But sometimes you got to stand your ground and you've got to fight. And in this video, I want to talk to you about this subject. Either fight like a champ or fold like a chump. Which one are you going to do when it's your time to shine? I want to read a story from 1 Samuel chapter 17 about David and Goliath. And I know you're familiar with the story, but are you familiar with these parts of the story? Here's what it says. It says in verse 22, And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage, and he ran into the army, and he came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, and out of the armies, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. Now, you gotta understand, the story tells us, if you go back to the beginning of the story, it tells us that Goliath, the champion of Gath, it told us how tall he was, it says he was cute, three, uh, three cubits in a span. How much is that? About ten feet tall. It's kind of mind blowing when you think about it. This dude's ten feet tall. The Bible says he had six fingers on each hand, because his hand was just too big for only five fingers, I guess, and six toes on each foot. The scripture tells us that his spearhead weighed 16 pounds. I don't know. That's, that's the weight of a bowling ball. How strong does a person have to be to throw a spear where the head of the spear is 16 pounds? It says he had a coat of mail, which weighed approximately between 140 and 150 pounds. This was a big old joker. He was so big, he'd have to call Shaquille O'Neal, little fella. Pat him on top of his head, what's up, little fella? And this is the guy who came out as the champion of Gath. Now, you gotta understand what a champion was in those days. A champion was one soldier that would fight one soldier from an opposing army, and whoever won, that was the decider of the battle. What were they fighting for? They were fighting for the freedom of their families. Goliath said, send me a man that I may fight against him. If he wins, we will be your slaves. And if you win, I mean, if, if he wins, we will be your slaves. But if I win, y'all will be our slaves. So they're fighting for the freedom of their entire country. They're fighting for the freedom of their family, their fathers, their mothers, their brothers, their sisters. And they're fighting for this freedom. And everybody sees Goliath. They hear his voice that sounds like thunder. And they're afraid. And he comes out and he challenges them in the Valley of Elah. Not for a day, not for a week, but for 40 days in a row. David's, David wasn't in the army. David was the little brother of some soldiers. And he goes down to take some food to his brothers and to find out how they're doing in the battle. And while he's there, this happens. In verse 22, or that which we just read. And then it says, in verse 23, And as he talked, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. So this is day number 40 or day number 41, but this is the first time David's heard it. And here's what it says in verse 24. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. What did they do? They folded. When the time of their battle, the confrontation with the giant showed up, they folded. Let me ask you a question. When your giant shows up, are you going to fold or are you going to fight? I remember, I remember a very, very, very vivid situation like this for me when I was in the sixth grade. It's the only time in my life I got beat up by a girl. And I mean, she beat me up too, boy, literally. And, and so my family moved around a lot. I went to nine different schools growing up, nine different schools. My family moved around a lot. Um, I went to uh, two different elementary schools, like three different junior high schools, maybe four, and then a couple of different high schools. I mean, it was just like we moved around a bunch. And so we grew up in Pennsylvania in this little coal mine, like coal mine country, Lewistown, Pennsylvania, where people talk what you would consider pretty funny. I'd say, hey, Marn, they didn't even call me Myron, they called me Marn. Hey, Marn, where, where are you going then once in a while? Right, and that's how we talk, we moved. And so we moved from there to, Pencil, to Florida, to Tampa, Florida. So all my cousins in Pennsylvania, they called me Marn. Marn, what, you, what, what are you doing then once in a while? You want to come over to the house then? That's how we talked, growing up. And then my cousins in Florida were like, Marn, what you doing? Right, so, and so I moved to Florida, and, and the kids on the bus, they did not like us because we talked funny. Like, kids don't need a reason. If you're different than them, they're not going to like you. And so I remember they picked on us every day. They called us names. They threatened to kill us. They threatened to beat us up. Me and my five little brothers, my older brother went to another school. And, 
and, and they'd just pick on us. Um, and I remember going home and thinking, I hate this school, I hate this town, I hate living here. And I remember one day we had to go to school, and I was like, Dad, do we have to go to school? These kids are always picking on us. He said, I'm going to tell you, boy, I'm going to tell you what you do. He said, you take the first one, and they, you grab them by the collar, and you beat them about the head and shoulders. They'll never mess with you another day in their life. And I'm thinking to myself, he's crazy, they're crazy. I'm surrounded by crazy people. My dad's from this place. I'm sure this makes sense to him. I was born here, but I'm just getting here, and this does not make sense to me. I said, but dad, what if it's a girl? He said, I, I'm in the sixth grade now. He said, I don't care nothing about that. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I was way more scared of him than I was of them. And I remember that day, we're in the car, and we're, my brothers and I, we were just so tormented by these other kids. And I remember this girl came up to me, and she had a stick in her hand. She said, I'm going to hit you in your head with this stick. I grabbed her by the collar, and I was like, put it, put it, put it, put it, put it, put it. And I'm, I'm hitting her in the head, and then she's trying to hit me with this stick, and I'm wrestling, and it hits this patrol, the girl Mary. Mary was about the size of Goliath in the sixth grade. I'm sure she had flunked at least 17 times. She's taller than I am now, and she had a voice that's deeper than mine will ever be. And she said, why you hit me in my head with that stick? I said, what me? It was her. She literally, I'm not exaggerating. I know it sounds like an exaggeration. It's not. She picked me up over her head, threw me on the ground. They're beating me to, they're beating the living daylights out of me. The bus comes, they all take off running. And I got up, and I didn't feel anything, but I had this big old knot on my left arm. We went to the principal's office. But do you know what happened after that day? Those kids never said another cross word to us ever. I was like, I thought my dad was a nut. He's actually a prophet. Okay, so anyway, so I stood and fought that day. I wish I could say that every day in my life I stood and fought after that. I'm going to tell you another story later on about something that happened to me in my life where now, in hindsight, I know that me and my family would have been better off had I stood and fought my, stood my ground and fought, but I didn't. I capitulated to life, and I allowed the challenge, the champion that was challenging me, I allowed him to intimidate me to the point where I just gave up. And it almost, like, it literally almost took me completely out of the game of entrepreneurship. Well, uh, here's what it says in verse number 25. And all the men of Israel said, Have you seen the man, have you seen this man that has come up, surely, to defy Israel? Is he come up? And it shall be that the man that killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches. And he will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. What does that mean? That means the person that kills this champion, the king said, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of money. And he said, and you get to marry the king's daughter, and no more taxes. Like, I don't want the king's daughter. I don't want the money. Just give me the no more taxes. Can I get a witness one of my people? Right, I'm like ready for that one, right? So now, not only is he fighting for the physical freedom of his family, but he's fighting for the financial freedom of his family as well. And then it says in verse 26, and David spake to the men that stood by him saying, what shall be done? How do I know he did that? Because that's what you say when they say they're going to give you a whole bunch of money and you ain't going to have to pay taxes no more and you get to marry the king's daughter. You say, well, say, tell me, say what? So David said, David said, uh, speaking to the men, verse 26, um, that stood by him saying, what shall be done to the man that killed this Philistine and take away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? I want you to notice the language he said. He said, this uncircumcised Philistine. Now, when you read this as a Westerner, that question doesn't make any sense. But when you read this as a Hebrew, it makes perfect sense. Because what was the circumcision? The circumcision was the reciprocation of the covenant with God. That's when Moses, well, that's when Moses, that's when Abraham reciprocated the covenant that God made with him in Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 15. And now Moses did the circumcision in Genesis chapter 17, I think it was. And he said, he said, okay, I'm in covenant with you. And a covenant was a promise that you made on your life. And so God promised his great, 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 great grandfather Abram that if anybody curses you, I'll curse them and I'll bless those that bless you. And when David heard Goliath cursing the armies of Israel, he knew Goliath couldn't win. Something he heard gave him faith, that gave him the ability to overcome, to overcome the giant which he saw. What do we learn from that? We learn that doubt is created in the eyes, but faith is created in the ears. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. When I rehearse in my ears the words of God that he has already spoken, it gives me the ability to overcome any obstacle that I see in front of my face. Watch what happens next, y'all. It says, and David spake, verse, 26, verse 27, and the people answered him again after this manner, saying, so shall it be done to the man that killeth him. So I want you to understand what happened there. David had, a, had literally had a contract to kill Goliath. 
He didn't just kill Goliath because Goliath was threatening God or threatening God's people. He didn't just kill Goliath because Goliath was threatening his brothers. He killed Goliath because he was going to get paid to kill Goliath. David negotiated his contract three times. The men told him what was going to happen. He said, say what's going to happen? They told him again. Then they rehearsed it again three times. Why three times? Because in the Hebrew, according to Hebrew law, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. So now, this is a legal and binding contract. People told him, this is what's going to happen to the man that kills Goliath. David said, so I ain't just going to remove the reproach from Israel. I'm going to get great riches. I'm going to get the king's daughter to marry. And no more taxes for my family. Let me add it. Well, they went and told the king what David said. Verse 28. Um, Well, first, his his brothers were irritated with him. And Eliab... The eldest brother heard when David spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David and said, Why comest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou hast come down that thou mightest see the battle. If David was a smart aleck little brother like my little brothers could be, and like I was with my older brother, okay, keeping it real, I would have said, Come down and see the battle. I don't see a battle. Y'all high and y'all ain't fighting. That's what I'd have said, right? David's brother was jealous because earlier in chapter 13, Samuel came down and was looking for the son of David that he was going to anoint to be the next king of Israel. And David didn't even get invited to his own coronation service. Just because God put greatness inside of you, don't expect the people who are the closest to you to see it. Sometimes the people who are the closest to you, it's hardest for them to see. David didn't even get invited to his own coronation, and Samuel had to look at one brother after another. Nope, the Lord has not chosen this. Nope, the Lord has not chosen this. Nope, the Lord has not chosen this. He said, surely you have another son. His father said, yeah, but that's just David. Calling. And here's what Samuel said. The Lord's anointed is before you. Do you understand that that it's not uncommon for common people to not see the uncommon greatness that is in you? That's not uncommon. That's natural. That's normal. Do you understand? Joseph's brothers couldn't see Joseph's dreams. They couldn't understand Joseph's words. David's brothers couldn't understand his anointing that was for his appointing. So they thought, oh, I know your pride. You just think you're something because Samuel anointed you instead of us. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? This cause is bigger than your little petty beef against me. The cause of our family's freedom is bigger than the fact that you think I'm being prideful. The cause of our family's freedom is bigger than Goliath. But you clearly can't see that or you wouldn't have been running from him. Don't be mad at me because I ran towards what you ran from. See, the people in our family, they want to keep us safe. They want to make sure we're going to be okay. So they want us to be afraid of what they're afraid of. But we don't know how to be afraid of those things. I'm an entrepreneur. I don't know how to be afraid of entrepreneurship. I don't know how to be afraid of the, what you call a lack of security. You know what I'm afraid of? I'm afraid of the mediocrity that comes with security. I'm afraid of the averageness that comes with going along to get along and blending in and signing the banana to be one of the bunch. I'm more afraid of that than I am of attempting something that doesn't work. I'm more afraid of folding than I am of fighting and losing. I would rather fight and take a chance of dying than not to fight at all and just go and be the slaves of these Philistines. That's what David was fighting against. He said, is there not a cause? Isn't the cause bigger than? Isn't it worth fighting for? Hey, let me ask you a question. You're watching this right now on YouTube. Isn't your family's financial freedom worth fighting for? Like, isn't setting your family up for generations worth fighting for? Isn't being able to take care of your aging parents worth fighting for? I don't know if it is for you, but for me, oh, it's everything. Isn't leaving an inheritance to your children's children worth fighting for? For me, it is. I get it. There's a risk. But even not to risk is, the risk, is a risk. Everything's a risk. To walk is to risk falling down. To drink water is to risk drowning. But some risks are just worth taking. Anyway, I got a little worked up there. I'm going to pump the brakes eventually. Uh, And then it says, um, and he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after four minutes. David is getting this contract locked in. And when the words were heard, which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul. And he sent for him. And David said to Saul, I love this. I love this. Let no man's heart fail because of him. 
Thy servant will go and fight this Philistine. Do you understand what's necessary right now? Do you understand we are at a crossroads in the United States of America? We're at a crossroads in the world. Where are the people who are willing to stand up and say, enough is enough already? Where are the parents who are not going to capitulate to the politically correct elitists who want boys to go in our little girls' bathrooms? Where are the people who are going to stand up and fight for, the, for, fight for women's rights? instead of special rights for people with weird agendas. You say, Myron, I can't believe you said that. Well, you might as well believe it, because I said it. You gotta, you, you, I mean, you have, you have to be drinking a particular brand of Kool-Aid to act like you don't get it. It's, a, it's like time somebody stood up and fought for the rights of our children and our children's children. And somebody like, oh, but I don't want to offend anybody. Okay, so we, we're going to let them, we're going to let them take control of our children. Like Joe Biden said recently, he said, these are our children. There's no such thing as our children. Now, me and my wife, we have, we have our children. After that, we, we, there ain't no our children. There's your children and my children. And your children ain't my children, my children ain't your children. And the government don't have any children. But they're trying to take control over our children and act like they're the ones that are responsible for them. And there are some states in the United States of America where the government can come and take your children because they disagree with what you believe? Okay. Where are the people who are willing to stand up and fight for the freedoms that, the freedom to think, the freedom to speech, the freedom to be an individual and not go along to get along? Hey, you know what? Even people, I dis even people that I disagree with, I'll stand and fight for their right to be, I'll stand for, and fight for their right to believe what they want to believe, even when I disagree with them. I, I, racism is as dumb as a box of rocks. But a person at least has a right to be a racist. Yeah, I said it. I believe that homosexuality is wrong, but a person has a right in the United States of America to be one. But here's what you don't have a right. You don't have the right to teach my children that it's okay and take my right for me to teach them that it's not okay. I ain't cool with it, and I'm ready to fool with it. And David said unto Saul, thy servant kept, oh, uh, no, 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 I got a little excited, got ahead of myself. And when the word, uh, in verse uh, 32, and David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against him, against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Do you understand? People who live their lives capitulating the fear, they want to project their fear on you. Don't take it. Don't take their fear. He said, you can't fight this man. So here's what Saul's saying. I'm the tallest dude in Israel. I can't fight him. You're littler than me. You can't fight him. Hey, don't try to superimpose your beliefs on me. Because just because that's what you believe, your belief is not my reality. And it's not going to be my experience in reality. I said I'm going to fight him. I don't care how long he's been fighting. He ain't never fought nobody like me before. It ain't the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. And this dog got some fight in him. Y'all hear me? You, I, somebody heard me before I drove up. And then it says... David said unto Saul, verse 34, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him. <laughs> David showed up on a totally different level than me. Because I'm going to say, Mr. Bear, Yogi, you enjoy that. You want me to go get some gravy for this lamb chop you're about to have? I'm like, I ain't fighting no bear for no lamb, but not David. David said, this is my responsibility, and I'm taking it seriously. He said, I went after a bear. I went after a lion. And he said, to the lamb out of the flock, verse 35, and I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, like, how dare you take my lamb chop? I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. And thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing hath he, he hath defied the armies of the living God. He said, hey, I'm, I'm, you can't lose the stuff I use. I'm going to show you the stuff David used. It's going to blow your mind. It's going to blow your mind. Why is David, why is this boy not afraid to fight a lion? Why is he not afraid to fight a bear for a lamb? He's like, this, this giant? Oh, I already got experience with that. This is going to be easy. Then it says, <coughs> and David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with thee. <laughs> when the when. People who are afraid, when they find somebody who's not afraid, first they'll try to discourage you, but when they realize it's impossible to discourage you, they'll try to encourage you. All right, you go. May the Lord be with you. I'm going to pray for you. 
And Saul armed David with his armor and put a an helmet of brass upon his head, and he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded, upon, girded his sword upon the armor and essayed to go, for he, he, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. See, people who are afraid, they will want you to use their methodologies that won't work for them, and they somehow want you to believe that they'll work for you. I ain't buying it. David said, I can't go with these. I have not proved them. I ain't going to do something that don't work. Like I was talking to some folks this morning here at my studio. Like when I do events, like when I do live events for adult people, I don't serve alcohol. Why? I can't go with these. I've not proved them. I've already seen the damage that alcohol can do. And I'm not saying that alcohol is necessarily wrong if a person wants to consume it. I ain't going to consume it. I quit drinking when I was 11. I'm done. I'm through. It's a wrap. And I ain't going to serve it to anybody else. Why? Because I can't go with it. I haven't proved it. Right? I'm not going to do something just because everybody else is doing it. I don't have shiny objects in there. Sometimes people do stuff and it works and I still ain't going to do it. Why? I can't go with this. I haven't proved it. If you've got something that works, if you've got a methodology that works, do you, boo. Stop trying to do somebody else. Stop trying to do somebody else's thing. Hey, guess what? I, it was a great day of my life when I realized I have no competition. Like, zero. You might be able to make a funnel better than me. You might be able to do a presentation better than me. You might be a better speaker than me. You might be a better coach than me. But guess what? You, can't be, you ain't better at me than being me. And I ain't better at you than being you. And so while you're being you, I can celebrate you. You go get them, dude. You go get them, girl. And when I'm being me, you can either celebrate me or tolerate me. But one thing you can't do is you can't eliminate me because I'm fixing to do me. And then it says, um, verse number uh, 37 Oh, no, verse number 38, and Saul, uh, verse number 39, and David girded his sword upon his armor and said, uh, verse number 40, and he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and he put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had even, even a script and a sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine, and David came and drew near, I'm, I'm sorry, and the Philistine came and drew near unto David, and the man that bare his shield went before him. His shield was so heavy he had somebody else carrying it. That's how big Goliath's shield was. <laughs> He's going to wish he had it in a minute. Uh, <laughs> um, and the Philistine came and drew near unto David, and the man bare his shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked, out, looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said unto David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh to the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, you come, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied, and this day the Lord will deliver thee into my hand. And I will smite thee and take thy head from thee, and I will give thy carcass to the host the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day to the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth and the earth that the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all the, assemble shall, all the assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and with spear, but the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. And, David, and it came to pass when the Philistine rose and came and drew nigh unto David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. The Philistine thought was expecting David to run away like everybody else did. I bet he was so shocked this little dude running at, he's running at the little dude and the little dude running at him. Like, wait a minute, Dave, why is David running towards the Goliath? David is running towards Goliath to get more momentum for the stone he's about to slay. Hey, here's what I'm gonna tell you. Stop running from your enemy and start running towards your enemy knowing that the victory is already yours. Here's what it says. And verse 49, And David put his hand in the bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead, and the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. And David prevailed, prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. Watch this now. But there was no sword in the hand of David. See, when you, David said, I'm going to do this the way I do stuff. I don't have a sword. I don't have a shield. I got a sling. I got a stone. I got a stick. And with, hey, you know that, you know that phrase we used to say when we were little kids, sticks and stones can break your bones, but names are never. David said, I got some sticks and some stones. I'm about to break some bones up in here. You might call me a name, but I'm about, I'm about, to, I'm about to break some bones. And says, there was no hand 
there, I'm sorry, there was no sword in the hand of David. And then it says in verse number 51, Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And the Philistines saw their champion was dead. They fled. Now here's what, here's what this story is about. This story is about an apparent champion. His name's Goliath. And this champion was such a champion. He was so big and so intimidating that just his presence made everybody fold like a chump. He was the champ that made everybody in Israel fold like a chump. But David, David was the, he was the champion of Israel that believed more in the words of God that he heard in his ears than he did the, 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 the size and might of Goliath that he saw with his eyes. And David was the champion that caused Goliath to fold and to fall like a chump. Do you understand that every time an obstacle faces you, do you understand every time you're faced with something that seems impossible, that obstacle that seems so big is your very opportunity to show that you are a champion? Because if you're unwilling to show that you're a champion and fight like a champion, if you're unwilling to fight like a champion, you will fold like a chump. David's brothers didn't go down in history to fight Goliath, even though they had 40 days to fight Goliath before David ever got there. Saul did not go down in history as the person who killed Goliath, even though he had 40 days to fight Goliath before Goliath ever got there. The enemies that have, that, that have caused other people who you know to fold, don't let those enemies cause you to fold. I remember back in 2010 when I got audited by the IRS, and I hired a tax litigation consultant. He said, Myron, you got two choices. I was broke as a joke and ready to choke, y'all. You don't even hear me. I was broke. They said, you need to pay us $1,065,000. I didn't have a million dollars. I didn't have $65,000. You know why? I lived too close to the edge. I made a lot of money and I spent a lot of money. Now I make a lot of money and spend almost none by comparison. Why? Because I ain't trying to fall off that cliff again. And guess what? They said, you owe us a million sixty-five dollars My tax litigation consultant, consultant, Dan, he said, here's what you could do. You got two choices. You go make four million, pay the tax on the four million, and then pay the other million sixty-five on the, with the money that's left over, or you can go broke and make a deal. And to, at the time, it seemed like going broke and making a deal was my best option. It seemed like the closest option. It seemed like the easiest option. It seemed like the fastest option. But guess what? I did that one, and I lived on borrowed money for two years. And I got a, like, I, I was able to negotiate a deal because I was broke. I was able to negotiate a deal where I paid the IRS $10,820 for that million sixty-five thousand dollars that I owed. But you know what? When you are broke for two years, and you used to be, especially when you're broken, you used to be rich, it weighs on you. I was like, and the fact that, oh, they're coming after me for all this money, and all the fact that uh, being an entrepreneur is already hard, and I capitulated to the giant in my life. Almost didn't make it back. I remember sitting on my back porch in Lando Lakes, Florida, crying on my wife's shoulder after I'd already moved halfway across the country on borrowed money, and then lived on borrowed money for two years, crying on my wife's shoulder, I'm trying to be an entrepreneur and nothing I'm working on is working. I don't know what to do. <laughs> oh, it's going to be all right. We're going to make it. And she encouraged me when I was discouraged like you can't even begin to imagine. And you know what? I got back on that entrepreneurial horse. And this time, and, and by the way, they said if you're ever late paying your taxes again, you're going to have to pay that million sixty-five thousand dollars Well, I wasn't making enough money not to be late. And I didn't know enough about accounting not to be late, so I was late again. And so I ended up, end, ended up even though I did the offer and compromise, even ended up having to pay the, ten, the million sixty-five thousand dollars after the fact. So glad I did. That time I didn't capitulate. I fought the giant, and I won. And yeah, we still paid hundreds of thousands of dollars a month in taxes for the time being till we get some more real estate assets in place where we can offset some of that income. But guess what? I won't. I won't allow a giant to cause me to capitulate again. I want to challenge you. Here are some of the things that David did to fight like a champion instead of folding like a chump. First thing he did was he remembered his anointing. What does that mean? He remembered. I believe the reason David went out and fought against the, giant, fought against the lion and fought against the bear is because I, I don't know that it happened between the time he got anointed and the time he got appointed, but I believe it did. David was anointed to be the king of Israel, and he was a shepherd. An anointing is always for an appointing. David was anointed, but he was not yet appointed. 
So here's what happens. When you understand your purpose and you know it's not fulfilled yet, it gives you a level, it gives you the feeling of being invincible. And I believe David knew that because of the promise of God that the, the prophet had told him, you are going to be the king over Israel. He wasn't the king yet. He knew the lion couldn't beat him and he knew the bear couldn't beat him. And he knew Goliath couldn't beat him. Why? Because I've not yet stepped into the appointing for my anointing. And when you know what the anointing is in your life, and when you've discovered that intersection where passion meets proficiency, and you're working in the area of your life that you know you were created for, you know you are invincible until your assignment is done. That's what I mean when I say you can't lose with the stuff I use. When you step into your assignment, when you're like Esther, like what Mordecai said to Esther, when she was like, I can't go before the king. If I go before the king, he might have my head. And Mordecai said, it could be that you were born for such a time as this. She said, okay, have everybody fast. And at the end of the fast, I'm going to go talk to the king. And it worked in grand fashion. See, you can't lose when you step into your purpose. You can't lose with the stuff I use. David stepped into his anointing. But I'm going to tell you something else he did. David not only stepped into his anointing, but David was willing to take on a battle to accumulate more assets. What does that mean? David said, I'm going to get paid how much? Sometimes we've got to count the cost of getting paid, and sometimes the amount that we're going to get paid, that big payoff at the end of the risk is worth the risk. David counted the cost. He said, okay, I'm going to increase my assets if I go fight this giant. The king's going to enrich me with great trade. Like, hey, I'm going to tell you something now. I don't do business because I don't do business for fun. I do business to get paid. You can do business for fun if you want. And I know, hey, he's one of those prosperity gospel preachers. Whatever, bro, you do you. I, I ain't thinking about you. I, when I engage in business in the marketplace, I expect to get paid. I expect to get paid well, and I do get paid well. Why? Because that's what I'm, I negotiate my contracts well, and I get paid what I get paid. And when people try to negotiate with me, I'll negotiate if it makes sense. But when it's time to get paid, it's time to get paid. Watch this. But not only that, David walked in his autonomy. What does that mean? Saul tried to get David to fight with Saul's armor. David said, I can't fight with your armor. I got to fight with my armor. I don't know how to use this coat of mail. I don't know how to use this helmet of brass. I don't know how to use this, this, I don't know how to use this sword. I know how to use a stone. I'm going to use a stone. I know how to use a stick. I'm going to use a stick. I know how to use a sling. I'm going to use a sling. I'm going to use what I know how to use. I'm not going to use what you tell me is better than the stuff I use because it don't even work good enough for you to go fight the giant. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to walk in my autonomy. I'm not going to try to be somebody else. I ain't going to try to be Tony Robbins. I ain't going to try to be Russell Brunson. I ain't going to try to be Gary Vee. I ain't going to try to be Alex Ramosi. I ain't going to try to be J Jordan Peterson. I'm going to be Myron Freddie Golden. And my recommendation for you is don't try to be me. Walk in the strength of your autonomy. There is a reason God gave you the experiences you've had. There's a reason that God gave you the life that you've had. So that you can go out and be the person in the marketplace that no one else can be. If you will do this, when it comes time for you to fight like a champion or fold like a chump, fight like a champion, and then you will discover that you can't lose with the stuff I use. Stay blessed by the best, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. In the meantime, in between time, peace out, Cub Scouts.